It is my absolute pleasure now and honor to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Ruth O'Hara. Dr. O'Hara mm. is the Lowell W. and Josephine Q. Berry Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And Dr. O'Hara has spent decades conducting clinical research utilizing a multi-system and multi-dimensional approach. She is a brilliant scientist, as you will see today, and her vision for the field has been ahead of its time. The core of her research is to investigate how cognitive information processing deficits subserve effective system, symptoms in psychiatric disorders and interact with key brain networks integral to these disorders. As many of you would know, Dr. O'Hara is a true force of nature. Her incredible capacity to knit together people, systems, and discipline is the secret ingredient behind so many successful careers at programs at Stanford and beyond. As Senior Associate Dean for Research in the Stanford School of Medicine since 2019, Dr. O'Hara has overseen significant growth of our research enterprise, from discovery to population and precision health. This is all the more impressive as it incurred, occurred during the pandemic. Dr. O'Hara has also been responsible for training generations of new investigators in the field of psychiatry. She has developed and led one of the first multi-site training programs at 30 academic sites nationwide, which has graduated over 450 postdoctoral fellows, both MD and PhD, with the vast majority entering academic careers in mental health. And some of you are here today. Dr. O'Hara serves as director and PI for Stanford's Clinical and Translational Science Award, the CTSA. Most recently, Dr. O'Hara and colleagues were awarded an NIH Autism Center of Excellence grant. Dr. O'Hara also serves, we are thrilled to say, as co-director for our Center for Precision Mental Health and Wellness, and is the best possible collaborative partner one could hope for. We've collaborated together for the past decade, and it's because of Ruth that I was first able to make the move from Sydney to Stanford. I know many others here today and beyond have successful careers because of Dr. O'Hara. Join me in welcoming Dr. O'Hara to the podium for her keynote presentation. Well, thank you very much, Leanne. I think um, it's very hard to follow that introduction. Uh, uh, really, uh, absolutely honored. Um, I think, you know, in my, you know, you start to, at my age to look back at your career <laughs> and say, as much as maybe looking forward and say, what did I do right? And one of the things I certainly did right was help recruit Leanne Williams, Steeler from the Sydney University of Sydney in Australia and bring her here to help us with the vision of precision mental health and well-being. I mean, she is just an amazing, you talk about me being a force of nature, Leanne, you are incredible in all you do. Um, she also has brought together a group of investigators that is truly diverse. Um, I have occasion to say the thing maybe that shouldn't, that should be said that often isn't. We have to be very cautious as we advance on DEI initiatives that we're not simply actually taking uh, gender representation and uh, representation of underrepresented minorities and ascribing it to all the DEI initiatives and not to actually the mainstay of what we're here about today. And so that's something that uh, I can already see uh, very easy to happen. And it's absolutely phenomenal what Leanne Williams has done in terms of forging true diversity among scientists, among staff, among her uh, mentees, her postdocs, her junior faculty, in a way that really is living the ideal that we talk about here at Stanford for DEI. And so I'm very grateful to Leanne for that. <clears throat> 
So what I'm going to talk about today is really one component of our processing systems that I think is pretty vital to, in fact, uh, psychiatric disorders, and that's cognition. I have no financial relationships with commercial or industry organizations. I still wear pay less shoes. I have a lot of NIH funding, and I'm very appreciative of that. And I do have to disclose that I served on the DSM-5. And I have a lot of admiration for what the DSM-5 uh, brings and the growth it has made, but recognize indeed the limitations, not least of which is how do we make sense of psychopathology given current nosology? It's a real challenge. We had some wonderful collaborators and colleagues visit yesterday, and this was a conversation that we had frequently. So if you look at the current DSM-5, and even with the parsimonious approach it took, such as removing uh, disorders that were not other specified, uh, trying to actually integrate some of the more robust genetic findings, we still have over 600,000 ways to actually diagnose post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's only one. This is not a reflection on the DSM-5 per se. It is a reflection on the fact that we as a field need to be more integrative, need to bring different components to the table, much as was articulated so well by Joss Jordan today. One of the disorders I focused on is depressive disorders. And in a, a World Health Organization a document that came out, a report from them in 2017, depressive disorders are the number one cause of disability globally. It's estimated that there is about a trillion in lost productivity uh, every year because of depressive disorders. More than 322 million effective, and of course, this number has grown during the pandemic, sadly, many suicides, which is a critical area that we need to address more fully. And we also need to address making sure that we're removing the stigma that has so haunted the field of mental health and psychiatry for so long. But despite the tremendous success of different lines of medication, such as the SSRIs, uh, which work for some people, but not for so many others, here is an example from a study that was conducted by uh, Greg Fonzo, who's now done at the University of Austin, Texas. For whom does an antidepressant work? Reporting on the large Embark study and comparing sertraline, a standard SSRI, versus placebo and finding absolutely minimal differences in the effect. So when our medications are not mounting a more successful effect on symptoms than placebo, we know we have a way to go. So what can we do to improve diagnosis and treatment? We've heard a lot today about ORDOC and the different approach that ORDOC brings, and it sure does. But I think one domain that is actually if the low-hanging fruit is cognitive functioning. And there's no doubt that ORDOC has started to incorporate components of cognition into their research models. But many psychiatric disorders, if indeed not all, are hallmarked by impairments in cognition, from schizophrenia to depression, anxiety, PTSD, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, increased awareness in bipolar disorder. Some of the main cognitive domains, your executive functioning, your ability to organize, strategize, your ability to inhibit difficult or negative information while paying attention to the positive. Your ability to process information at a speed that is in touch with your environment, not too slow, not too fast, an optimal speed. Our brains are much like vehicles in that regard with true neuronal speed that we often neglect to consider when we're thinking of psychiatric disorders. Our working memories, our long-term memories, and when I started as a cognitive psychologist, which we were then called, uh, I'd be now called probably a cognitive neuroscientist, uh, it was really unusual to talk about cognition 
in the domain of psychiatric disorders. So we felt that by the early uh, 2010s, 2012, when we saw a bevy of editorials come about, about the involvement of cognition in psychiatric disorders, that this was now more widely recognized. Uh, but the interesting thing here is our progression in this domain has still been pretty minimal over the last decade. It's also important to note that a lot of the focus on cognition and its contribution to psychiatric disorders has come from the field of aging. So from a lifespan approach, where often aging can actually be a siloed domain, there are many lessons that were thought to us as a result of the evidence that when you start to age and lose both physiological uh, brain processes as well as functional processes, cognition is also impacted. And so there were several editorials that came out at that time that started to drive our thinking. This is an old slide, but it sustains the test of time. We know that as we get older, our cognition takes a hit. There isn't anybody who's into their fifth decade here who has not experienced that. We also know that there are several constant and consistent components of neuronal physiology that are negatively impacted as we age. Everything from hippocampus and temporal lobes to uh, the uh, extent to which, and I'm just going to skip ahead, we have our fire good dopamine, we have good and effective serotonergic function, we also see an increase in white matter lesions and hyperintensities. So it became a model to consider that there are aspects of brain and brain functioning that might be actually negatively impacted in psychiatric disorders independent of age. So this led to a paper that I uh, wrote with Amit Ekin back in 2013, just as we are really starting to consider that. Are there overlapping neurocircuitry for cognitive dysfunction and psychiatric disorders? And the evidence is overwhelming that in fact there is. The human circuits, brain circuits, that have been identified for vision, for language, for motor movement, which was just raised earlier, so many of these overlap and also involve cognition. So one of the questions is, is there in fact a relationship between these circuits and the emotional processes they subserve and the cognitive information functioning? We did an initial study based on uh, the work that Amit was doing in emotional regulation and just cross-sectionally looked uh, to examine if, in fact, there was a relationship or an interrelationship between emotional regulation and cognition, and indeed found that in older adults, those who specifically had worse attention and poor working memory had much more trouble making emotionally laden conflict decisions and responding to emotionally laden stimuli. So it really begs the question of whether the emotional uh, difficulties and emotional regulation difficulties are secondary to, in fact, some of these fundamental cognitive information processing systems. Now, it's important to note that neither cognitive function nor brain cir uh, circuitry are routinely assessed, even to this day, in clinical care for psychiatric disorders. Why is that? Well, in part, it reflects a lack of sufficient evidence to date despite the fact that it's a decade out for some of these fundamental observations, based on the, uh, the evidence to that point, we haven't made the same strides that we should have made in this domain. Many still view issues to related to cognition and psychiatric disorders as only occurring in late life, when in fact you start to lose more of that cognitive infrastructure. And most importantly, I think, is often perceived as too complex to assess and make sense of. It was an excellent question raised by Usha today regarding the time it takes to actually bring all these systems together. And a part of that is that there is a complexity to, to doing that that really needs a lot of resources, a lot of energy, and a lot of out-of-the-box thinking. One of the things that most impressed me when I met Leanne Williams was that Dr. Williams said, we are waiting for almost the holy grail when we have enough information to start right now in defining biotypes 
and subphenotypes that might actually significantly impact how we diagnose psychiatric disorders and how we examine treatment response. In what I think is a seminal article in Lancet Psychiatry in 2016, she defined the six major large-scale neural circuits that exist in humans and started to explore how these actually can predict treatment response specifically and most importantly for her work in depression, in depressive disorders. This was a phenomenal sort of uh, sh shift. It seemed obvious, it's one of those things, but many of us are waiting for you know, some way to actually deconstruct the multiple circuits that we observe. But Leanne said, we have enough right now and let's examine those. So it raises the question of whether cognitive dysfunction and neural circuits in psychiatric disorders predict treatment response. So back in as early as 2012, one of the first studies that suggested this could be the case was conducted by Yvette Chalene when she looked at, in fact, sertraline and examined the differences between patients who responded to treatment and those who did not, and noted that those who had slower speed of processing probably reflecting fundamental neuronal impairments, were less likely to respond, and those who had lower hippocampal volume were also less likely to respond. This is a very important study. It wasn't really followed up on systematically in other domains that were non-aging, but it really was one of those studies that sort of started us to think about how important it was to consider cognition as a treatment response uh, factor in psychiatric disorders. Of course, one of the things that you realize when you do this kind of work is that it's never going to be identical depending on the treatment under consideration or the population under consideration. A very good example of this was actually a follow-up study that we did to consider the impact of executive function on response to cognitive behavioral therapy in late-life depression. Late-life depression affects a significant number of individuals in the United States. There is a one-to-one -one relationship among those who have late-life depression between suicide attempts and completing suicide. Makes it very different from what we see in younger adults with depression, where that ratio is approximately eight to one. So about 30% of older adults with major depression don't respond to non-pharmacological treatments, but often they're resistant to pharmacological treatments. So in addition, cognitive dysfunction in the executive domain is a core symptom of late light depression. So we made the conjecture and hypothesis that the 30% who are actually non-responsive to CBT probably with those who actually were impaired in their executive functioning because they couldn't manage or structure or handle the components of CBT therapy over 12 weeks. And what we found was exactly the opposite. We found that the individuals who had major depression disorder, who were in fact significantly impaired in the executive function domain, improved their mood by over 50%. They were the responders. So though it showed that cognition and cognitive dysfunction, the impact and treatment response may actually significantly vary according to the disorder and the treatment under consideration. And part of the reason we think that happened is because in navigating CBT, those with executive function who normal uh, deficits who normally actually struggle with organization, with problem solving, with a variety of the tools that are provided by CBT actually responded to those tools. They served as a scaffold for actually the improvement and that led to an improvement in mood. Uh, longitudinally, they didn't improve their cognition itself. So there was no positive effect of the CBT on their cognition, but there was an extremely positive effect on their mood, probably due to factors that involved managing their own day-to-day -day function more effectively. At the same time, Leanne Williams started to look at some of the fundamental neurocircuits that she had brought together in that seminal article for us to consider and examined whether or not 
in younger patients with MDD if those circuits were actually predictive of treatment response. And she found that the cognitive control circuit, again underscoring the vital component here, pretreatment dorsal lateral prefrontal co cortex hypoactivation and reduce connectivity in that area predicted non-remission in patients with MDD. And it's an excellent publication by uh, Leonardo Tozzi, who's here today in biological psychiatry in 2020, uh, with Leanne serving, of course, as his senior author and mentor that uh, demonstrated this very effectively, showing again the value of having this information and further underscoring the importance of cognitive domains and neurocircuitry for actually predicting treatment response. Uh, in a more recent study, again, do these effects continue earlier in the lifespan and for different disorders? A study by myself and Amit Ekin, published in Science Translational Medicine in 2019, found that actually neurocircuits, specifically the ventral attention network, predicted response to psychotherapy in individuals with PTSD. Those who actually showed impaired functional connectivity within the ventral attention network and combined, only in fact combined with verbal memory deficits, were the individuals who didn't respond well. It was the combination of both that yielded what we consider a subphenotype or biotype that is not responding well to that treatment, that could indeed be easily characterized, and that, in fact, leads us to mechanisms of action that might be involved here. But the number of studies actually looking at these combinations of cognitive processing and circuits are limited. I want to go back to one of the editorials um, that was uh, written by Susan Schultz, who's a great uh, geriatric psychiatrist who actually is an editor for the American Journal of Psychiatry. And she wrote a piece, and I usually agree with Susan on most everything, but she wrote a piece that said essentially the relationship between cognition and emotional health and psychiatric symptoms is reciprocal, which is highly likely, and therefore the direction doesn't count. Well, I would argue that the direction counts enormously because if we're not considering the direction, we're not considering where, in fact, the most important targets may be. So the significance of cognitive dysfunction is not just that it may help us predict treatment response. It also may aid in differential diagnosis of refinement of phenotypes where we see that slower speed of processing in one case is actually predicting a negative outcome in response to pharmacological treatment. And again, in older individuals with the same disorder, there is in fact a, 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 a benefit almost uh, that's conferred by the behavioral treatment because it assists those with executive dysfunction. But it also means that cognitive dysfunction presents as an opportunity for targeted treatment, augmentation, and intervention. To that end, hybrid treatments are now being considered in the labs of Leanne Williams, myself, and many others here that incorporate activity. We talk about motor activity in particular becoming a new area that's under increased investigation in psychiatry, cognitive training, uh, emotional function training, and combining those. But there are other approaches. RTMS, for example, uh, has been implemented. Can that help us with cognition? In one of the uh, most recent studies of the treatment of depression with tra uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, it was noted that it had actually very positive effects on cognitive function. So the future directions for us are more comprehensive, sensitive, and specific cognitive assessments administered routinely during diagnosis, more intervention approaches that target or incorporate cognitive information processing. And one of my own personal uh, favorites that I think is often the untapped area 
for us in the field of psychiatry is consideration of concurrent or comorbid medical disorders that impact cognition. Everything from sleep to immune to neuroendocrine function. In one of our own recent studies, because we have a prime focus in my lab on sleep, we found that actually older adults who conserved good uh, uh, memory function had actually slower uh, oscillations during deep sleep. The interesting thing there is there's many avenues for actually augmenting, improving uh, the oscillations. So we could actually work to target the oscillations and see if there's an associated improvement in their cognitive functioning. And the other important component is this expands to disorders across the lifespan, all different types of psychiatric disorders. The uh, cognitive phenotype of autism spectrum disorder is one of the most obvious. And as the recent recipients of an Autism Center of Excellence here at Stanford, uh, we've been trying for a long time to get one of those. These are the domains that also overlap. So the transdiagnostic uh, opportunity is not to be underestimated. So not only should we take all these approaches, but they should also begin earlier in the lifespan. I have so many. I could do a movie list of my collaborators. I want to acknowledge particularly the National Institute of uh, Mental Health and the National Institutes of Aging who have supported my work for so long, the Alzheimer's Association of America, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. O'Hara, for such a magnificent presentation and for being such a trailblazer. And you can see from all your collaborations just how much you've fostered so many studies. So we are open for questions. We have a few moments, uh, a few minutes. Any of you who have questions, please make your way to the microphones at the back. I'm going to ask our wonderful uh, Zoom host if we have questions from the chat. Yes, we do. So the first question that we have, first off says, thank you for your elegant presentation, Dr. O'Hara. And then the question is, are there good screening tools for cognition you'd recommend for an average mental health provider? Ah, that's a great question. <laughs> I, I think that there are very good tools that have borne the test of time. In the 1950s, Ray, who is French, developed the auditory uh, verbal memory test, which actually with the NIMH's uh, collaboration, we converted to a computerized version a few years ago. I think for memory deficits, that's a very straightforward test. Uh, for executive function, even though there's much more work to be done, there are many standard speed of processing. There's a, 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 a consortium of tests called the DCAPS. And uh, anybody wants to get more information on my favorites, just email me. My email is oroh at stanford.edu. Wonderful. We have a question from the floor. Hi. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, you mentioned uh, neural measures. You mentioned behavioral measures. I'm curious what you think about where we can get more mileage in terms of, of uh, uh, delivering precise treatments, and whether neural measures are privileged or whether... Yeah. Well, I think that's the million dollar question, and I think we had uh, a little bit more um, uh, of a sort of resource focus, but how do we start? Well, I think that's where Leanne Center has really started to bring us to, you know, we can't do everything all at once. We wish we could. And I think there was a misinterpretation when we started to have AI and AI approaches and algorithm approaches that we could just let the, those approaches loosen the data, whatever data we had. And we now recognize that data has to be harmonized, that in fact AI algorithms have to be tested for rigor and reproducibility, uh, may work in one group and not another, and we're not sure why. So there are a lot of efforts to actually achieve that. But then becomes the issue of what data? Any of our analytic approaches are only as good as the data we uh, give them. I think Lee took a very fundamental step for us 
in saying, we have enough data in your circuits to at least start with these components. And it's going to be an iterative process. I think in cognition, uh, we need to do the same. We need to actually have really a fundamental uh, assessment, I wouldn't call it a battery because that notes neuropsychology, that actually could be given in a very routine fashion uh, as part of any diagnosis for uh, any psychiatric disorder where we're testing the main domains. And there's a lot of evidence within domains, you know, of which ones are most associated or impaired with which disorder. And I think we have to start in those ways before we can actually uh, get to the more complex and ultimate dream of what precision medicine can bring us. Thank you. Question over here. Yeah. Thank you for the very enlightening talk. Um, I'm also very curious about your perspective on training um, psychiatric students. Um, since you had a study where you showed like certain cohorts showed a more uh, or a more positive percentage increase in mood. And I think it's also like, as you were already mentioning, these people will probably see a, a, relative, a bigger relative change in their day-to-day -day function. So obviously they're going to report better results than a control group, right? So if you would control for that statistically, or if you would just work with absolute numbers, I guess you would see different results. So obviously, like if you look at only the relative within cohort differences, you will see a bigger increase. But still, I feel like there, there could be some, there's some nuances that should be also investigated in such studies. And as such, I'm also interested to know your perspective on how much do you think we should also get students involved in in methods training, in statistics, because I feel like that's something that is very important, and I guess this is a, like a recurrent uh, topic in, in all the field, but um, yeah, I would like to know what your perspective I, is. I, I'll make my answer brief in the interest of time, because I see the red light flashing. I have to tell you, I think that's one of the most important things. And in fact, NIH itself has now, as I'm sure you know, required that we all actually talk about the validity of the measures we're utilizing, the validity of the analytic approach, and really account for the rigor and reproducibility. There's so many results, and yet uh, they don't all replicate. And why is that? And of course, when you come in as a junior faculty member, you're being asked to forge your way, and forge your way in a way that's unique. So you're not really being asked to come in and just replicate the study of your mentor or, or your colleagues. So I think it's critically important uh, we have at Stanford a range of such courses, but we don't mandate them. NIH asks that every institution create a good curriculum on rigor and reproducibility for basic, translational, and clinical researchers. And they will be asking individuals, much like we do our human subjects now, to be taking that. We're ahead. We've actually a course that we hope to uh, uh, roll out next year, but I think it's one of the most essential components, and I would take it a step further. In order to make sure that the individual patient sitting in Santa Rosa, down in Watsonville, is interested in contributing their medical data, understands the vit vital need for us to have the most extensive data sets possible, we have to provide that education, not just locally to our uh, scientists, but also to uh, the population at large, so that we're not having to tackle uh, the, the, uh, the lack of understanding sometimes for the initiatives we're pursuing. I think it should be taught in schools from the earliest stages. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Do you want to sneak in one more question? Yeah, sure, sure. We have one more question, and we will, with the audience's indulgence, we won't cut into our next speaker's time. We'll go one minute over at the end. Sorry, I'll keep it short. My name is Ala Youssef. I'm a aeroid researcher at the Stanford Amy Center. I guess my question was more about the cognitive uh, dysfunctioning. If there is a trajectory to how did the cognitive dysfunction deteriorate or improve within major depressive disorders, and one reason is, uh, if we know that there's significant time frames, do we need to assess cognitive dysfunction at different time frames of the major depressive disorder? 
It's a great question. I think most individuals, uh, you know, particularly if they're looking even at their DSM-5 or uh, standardly assessing in clinical care, recognize that at a certain age, if there appears to be forgetfulness associated with the mood, that we should probably test for the cognition. But it's not routine. It's becoming much more standard of a consideration in research now for schizophrenia, where the core deficits and mapping on very cleanly onto the neuroimaging uh, data that shows atrophy with age among those who have schizophrenia, that it's a very important component. But it is not standard to do it routinely in all such situations. And I think we're missing an opportunity and a window that can be very important by not doing that. Next steps, many steps to take. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so you much, Leanne. Thank you so much.